now Puja Atman Shri Swami Jyotir Mayananji commences tonight's satsang with the Sanskrit peace chant. <coughs> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Puname Vavashishyate Om Shanti 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 we begin the mystic song by Sri Swami Lalitananda, played and sung by Sri Swami Umananda and Rajanish. Our song tonight is called O Holy Mother Ganges. <laughs>
We are recording from the ashram of our revered Guru, Pooja Atman Shri Swami Jyotir Mayanandji in Miami, Florida. Today is August the 7th, 2018, Tuesday evening, and tonight Swamiji will be lecturing on the Yoga Vasishta. This is series 2018, class number 62. And now, Pooja Atman Shri Swami Jyotir Mayanandji. Om. Brahmanandam param sukadam kevalam jnana murtim dvanvati tam gagan sadrisham tattvam asyadi lakshyam ekam nityam vimalam achalam sarvadhi sakshi bhutam bhavati tam trigunarahita sadgurum tam namami om Adoration to Sadguru who is Brahman, the giver of supreme bliss embodiment of pure consciousness, one without a second, vast as the ether, infinite, eternal, beyond the three gunas and their modifications, the supreme preceptor. Yoga Vashishtha in Utpatti Prakarana, section 67. Sri Rama asked, O sage, how does the jiva, individual soul, arise from the divine self? And how is this soul related to the absolute self? This is a basic question to understand what you mean by the soul. People make a diff difference between the soul and themselves. This is me. But my soul, I don't know where, what will happen. <laughs> For simple understanding, <laughs> first stage of your spiritual insight has to develop regarding the soul. Soul and your body, body mindset, both are not identical. The identity with your body mind is not the complete picture of the soul. The soul's little radiation, the soul continues and you, you go on changing your body mindset. Bodies change, incarnations continue, but the same soul is moving in, through many embodiments. So that, the first stage of spiritual movement, immortality of the soul. <laughs> and that's what in the Gita I will read. <laughs> Nainam chindanti shastrani nainam dhati pavaka nachayanam kledayantyap nasho shaiti varuta. This soul within you cannot be destroyed by all the elements, fire, water, air, storms, cannot be destroyed by anything. The body and mind set will continue to change. And then you have to come to another level. The soul that goes on incarnating, that soul is absolute self reflecting in your mental process. The reflection of Brahman. And Enlightenment implies a full awareness 
at first level, I am immortal. The fear of death should not sit on your head. Second stage, limitations created by multiplicity and duality. That is also eliminated. as long as you view you are existing along with many factors, many spiritual beings whose minds you don't know what they are thinking. And you are driven by their minds. You have not attained liberation. In other words, as long as there is a vision of duality, there's something other than me exists. That's non-duality is a resolution. As long as there is duality, you are limited. Duality means both sides, there are two persons, each is limited by the other. You cannot sit back and say, I'm very happy. But we'll look at the partner. <laughs> but that's, these are simple points, but you have to assimilate it to have more clearer understanding. Think of your dream. First think of how, how did the whole dream world arise? You just went to sleep. Hardly five minutes have gone by. <laughs> and within that short duration, what happened? Who created a vast world with beginningless, endless, countless variations, past, present, future? And what is the reality behind all that? Similarly, first we understand this is what we call illusory modification. Just like mirage develops on a desert. <coughs> Many strange pictures arise out of the sky. They are not there. Even the blue sky is not there. In the same way, the entire dream process arises based on mental projection. Your mind projects in a proper way, healthy way, <coughs> speaking a relative term, you are experiencing waking state. And the mind is projecting not in a f complete way, not mature way, then it happens in your dream. Dream brings out a simple understanding. The all the dream world, your own consciousness has created. If you have horrible dream, you can't go after somebody. <laughs> I came to your house and got this horrible dream. <laughs> I will sue you. <laughs> so just as oh, you are responsible for all your dreams. Similarly, you are responsible for all your waking experiences. And when we say you, you of your dream was an illusory subject. Three things in your dream were illusions. The subject of the dream, 
the world that you experience was illusory and your experiences of gain, loss, pleasure, pain, all the three were illusions. But all this doesn't matter. You suffer. <laughs> if you have any <laughs> painful dream, you do suffer. as well as you enjoy. But when you wake up, <coughs> you find nothing ever existed and your mind doesn't, is not concerned who created it. And if whoever created it, what, where was he sitting to create it? <laughs> <laughs> Did this dream whole world where you sent to some far beyond the Milky Way and there was a world which came to you in your dream? <laughs> I'm joking, but some people have their type of thinking. <laughs> but all that type of thinking is kindergarten stuff. Time, space are practical realities. As long as you are dealing with practical reality, science is a profound movement. Not a single atom makes any mistake. All things have precision. But in spite of all that, the mind that sees all the precision, etc., in itself, is not the reality. A cloud veils the sun and thereby creates countless refractions of light, rainbows, shimmering lights, so many illuminations. But all those illuminations, who created them? And before creation, where were they sitting? In what form? <laughs> Simple point is to understand all the creation was not really a cre any creation. The sun remained always the same. <laughs> he was not lonely and he created all this for this recreation. But also the scriptures describe <laughs> for the matching up to the human mind. Eko aham bahusyama. God found himself, felt I'm alone. Let me be many. <laughs> That's the way. Just like he were given sugar coated pill. These statements are given to help your mind to become interested. <laughs> that God also thinks like us. <laughs> Try to understand now. With Similarly, you can tell a child, the son was feeling lonely, you see. <laughs> so he suddenly created a world of recreation. So he became the rainbow, he became shimmering lights, he became so many reflected suns. Oh baby, do you understand it? <laughs> Maybe. <coughs> P 
pressured by the sankalpas of the past, an individual soul continues to pass through numerous embodiments. It continues to experience birth, death, and varied conditions of life from one birth to another. So pointing to karma. And I go on reiterating, and that's perfectly in order, Kalgada Parinyaya, <coughs> hammering again and again. Because karma is always a mystery for the masses. Majority of people who have heard the word karma, they identify it with destiny. Everything has its karma. And that old grandfather created it. Brahma. <laughs> and karma cannot be changed. That is not so. Karma comes in three stages. First, you have to understand also by karma, you are not referring to things you are doing by your hands and feet, but thoughts that enter your mind, imaginations that enter your mind. All the manasa vacha karmana, through mind, through your speech, through your action, you are creating karmas. And karmic formation has its seed in the unconscious, known as samskaras. The samskaras that you have in the unconscious, those samskaras are vast. San that, or that's called sanchit karma, accumulated storehouse. And yet the storehouse does not occupy even a needle point of space. Mm -hmm. Previously it was difficult for them to understand. But now you have computers that tell you <laughs> how so much can exist. <laughs> Out of vast accumulated storehouse, only a little pinch is called prarabdha, fructifying karma. That has given you your embodiment, who you are. And the embodiment is formed at the time of death. Who will you be? Complete resolution does not come until the moment one is going to die. Now, first to understand, because many, many aspects, so let me clarify it. When you live your life, you are creating, you are using your mind in so many directions. Just like there is a boat in the river and it is, there are so many ropes that is securing the boat from say 10 or 15 points. If the boat is being controlled by say a hundred points, you don't know where the boat will go. The resultant will determine where the boat will go. Similarly, where will you be in the next birth? 
that will depend upon the resultant, not what you can think of, but what you have been thinking, what you have been desiring, what you have been giving value to. If you have been giving value to just being miserable, and then you decided not to be miserable, positive. So, you created one ounce of negativity, <laughs> half an ounce of positivity. <laughs> no joking, but try to understand. <laughs> now, at the time of death, suddenly the laws of nature, laws of creation, spills out the resultant which is surprising to, to this person or to the soul. That also is figurative, the soul doesn't yet know it. But that becomes its, its, its future. And that future, again, at the time of death, everybody doesn't have a clear expression. People have heard that last wish of the departing soul will lead the soul to where. So what he says, the last word, but don't follow it literally. It has nothing to do with literal. A person may cry and die. <laughs> so that's not his last wish. <laughs> and a person may not have even time to wish last may have an accident, but still the last operates automatically. And that last wish determines three things. Your parents, where will you be born? Or jati, your whole class of society where you will be you will match up with your karmic process. How long will you be in that embodiment? Your are you? And what will be the pattern of your joy and sorrow? Adversity and prosperity. All that is determined by prarabdha. But when, when, when you live with your prarabdha. You are always, you have always an inner potentiality of willpower. Your willpower expands. You develop more sense of freedom if a positive karma is operating. A good karma is bringing out its result some good virtuous deeds you have done and their result is coming in your life. Now you have more a sense of freedom. But if a negative karma dominates and operates in your life, then you lose that sense of freedom. Nevertheless, your will has the key to make immense changes in your karmic process. And the key lies is if you were to tune yourself to satsanga and develop the ability to do yogic movement, then you, you discover you are the architect of your destiny. You have so far been responsible for what you have been. And you are responsible to free yourself of your bondage and to attain liberation. This responsibility is absolutely yours. And as you line yourself on the positive direction, the whole world begins to support you. Because the essence within you is God. So, jati, ayu, bhoga. It 
If you don't attain enlightenment, then what happens? While you are working out your prarabdha karma, you are creating karmas that will fructify in future. Future implies even in this life, tomorrow is future. <laughs> future implies after death. Whichever way, it will operate in future. In some people, they do a lot of negative karmas. And they are blessed with winning lottery after lottery. <laughs> so, you should not think in an ordinary way. <laughs> you see, someone is very good karma. Why doesn't he have good result? <laughs> It doesn't go that way, because you have done many karmas. And many karmas are waiting in queue with tremendous <laughs> <laughs> eagerness. <laughs> so in according to divine mathematics, <laughs> those karmas are very powerful. They are allowed to have first movement. Then they other karmas. So therefore, all karmas do not have exact precision to operate. Some karma has to sit for its opportunity. It may happen in this life. It may happen two or two lives later. Some karmas wait. Some karmas are instant. Someone shout at a new or shout at them back. Now, if you attain enlightenment, first point to attain enlightenment, you draw from your good karmas. So when good karmas are operating within you, Develop an interest in discovering what is the source of all happiness. But this type of mental attitude is not easy. Dukhme sumiran sab kare. People become philosophical, spiritual when there is a, they are in misery. When they can't even walk, they are talking about philosophy. <laughs> when they walk, forget about philosophy. If you have that attitude, then you are too much of a kindergarten. So live your life in such a way, avoid the impact of the negative. Of course, turn to prayer, etc. But when the negative moves away, intensify your prayer. Now we are moving in a healthy manner. If you move that way, then you discover that your power of will within you is being fed by God himself. Your will is in tune with God's will. If you are following yamas and niyamas, then saranagati comes, you begin to relax, being in tune with God's will. You hold your desires, it will come normal, but you, do, you don't stick to it. Sometimes things will happen beyond your imagination. Accept it, thank God. Sometimes they will not happen beyond your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't, don't lose sight that you are supported by Divine Mother, who knows what is best for you. <laughs> so when you begin to develop that type of 
understanding. Now you are creating a process of ascending steps to liberation. Within your lifetime, you come to a state of enlightenment. Deep, deep down, you have no, no doubt in, in the understanding, no, no deviation from your root. If that has happened, all sanchit karmas is just like a dark room that contained a lot of film negatives, all style. <laughs> and you open the door, all the, those that we have photographed and kept the negatives, they all die in one movement. Similarly, all sanchit karmas move away. Enlightenment means you are free of all the burden, that karma that could have led you to million lives. They all go away. And all future karmas, called agami karmas, they cut down because karma will be operative if you view yourself as, as, you, as ego personality. I am the mind, body set with your ego. I am the doer, I am the enjoyer. If that type of mind is there, you will go on creating karmas. But now with enlightenment, mind that is highly advanced doesn't give value to the I. Your ego is a shaky entity. The moment you go to sleep, your ego runs away from you. <laughs> ego is therefore recognized by yourself as not the reality of you, but just an illusion. The real you is not the ego. Therefore, all karmas that are that ego-based illusion creates stop. All agami karma will stop. So only one point now, you live with your body. The bo you have already paralabdha karma that has given you body, mind, set. That paralabdha karma is not being exaggerated. It just flows on to conclude itself. While it concludes, you are not in any way affected by it. The only way it can be explained, just like in your dream, you are having horrible situations, as well as pleasant situations. But suddenly you come to realize it's a dream. Not, not, a, not a doubting state of mind, a clear understanding it's a dream. Now, dream may continue, but you are in deep down relaxed. You can see your own body tumble from, a, from steps. <laughs> and you would wake up smiling. So, that type of experience is in, in your enlightened personality. And once your prarabdha karma is over, there is no coming back. But for, that's a language for the masses. The moment you have attained enlightenment, you are not coming back. You are not in the world either. But to the world, to the masses, the world is real. So from their point of view, yes, the person, sage exists. From sage's own point of view, that's a different matter. <laughs> and that state of his point of view is not a talkable state. 
It's beyond mind. Just as wind is nothing but air in motion, so the jiva is nothing but consciousness mingled with illusion created by ignorance. Some souls are so involved in karma that will take a long time for them to attain release from the fetters of bondage. Now the different types of souls are being given in a very broad way. The classification follows. Mand, mand is dull. Souls that are dull. They take a long time in their karmic process and they don't care. <laughs> the idea of liberation is, <laughs> it doesn't please their mind at all. Then there are souls that are not so dull, they have developed some sensitivity, some rajas. They are called kshipta. Shiptas may take a hundred lives to attain enlightenment. <laughs> then there are souls called Vikshiptas. They are not completely distracted. Sattva has entered, mixed up in their personality. <clears throat> they may take just ten or twelve incarnations. <laughs> <laughs> Souls come to one pointed mind. Mind has developed one goal. If that is very clear, then we don't take any embodiment within this lifetime. And we turn to your attention to the world, then that's the Souls are in different stages. Some will attain enlightenment in few births. Some will take a thousand births. Well, some will attain illumination even in this very birth. And more surprising, some will, be, will come into embodiment enlightened. Nachiketa. He was enlightened. Why did he come into embody? <laughs> the explanation is there was one little shortcoming in that enlightenment. That shortcoming exhausted itself in the process of coming into human embodiment. It's a big austerity to come into human embodiment. Squeezed it to a little. Consciousness, which is pure, absolute consciousness, Brahman, led by ignorance, becomes identified with the effects of ignorance. That is to say, first you are identified with the chitta, the mind stuff. And it is led by that mind stuff that we talk about, all the details about incarnating soul, bondage, liberation, 
who figures it all out, your chitta. <laughs> Identified with the mind, the soul becomes the experiencer of pleasure and pain. Identified with prana, the vital forces, the soul becomes a living being. Identified with the subtle body, the soul experiences heaven and hell. That also I have explained to you before, heaven and hell are experienced always. Heaven is a kind of joyous experience. Hell, when you don't have any joy, but but human embodiment controls your nervous system is your boon <laughs> to a certain degree of happiness. Your nervous system will not permit you to go through that. You will become unconscious. You will become hysterical. And similarly, pain also is controlled. You open up to pain, but to a certain limit, immediately you pass on to unconscious state. So heaven and hell are being experienced in your practical life, but in a very limited way. But when you leave the body, and you are in a position to go into another and in between soul is only with your astral body. And now the fructification of virtue and vice, good and bad karma, those fructification go so intense that there is no limit. The limit is according to your karma, karmic, the quality of your karma. And that, that is what people speak about, heaven and hell. So after um, death of the body, the soul experiences heaven or hell based on karmas. And for that, the soul doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> but again, for the masses, it's always brought about in the form of how long it takes and Many lokas are described, but that, that's all distractions. Being identified with the physical body, the soul is, becomes related to its parents, other relatives and friends. Soul, therefore, is becoming all that. Soul becomes your body, identified with the physical body. Soul becomes your pranas, vital forces, thereby you say you are alive. Soul becomes your mind, intellect. Soul becomes your ego. In other words, the soul is identified with five sheets. Five sheets are five coverings. Physical body is your first sheet. Second is, your physical body cannot exist without prana, vital forces. So the next layer is vital forces. And vital forces will not have any intelligence how to operate unless there is mind behind it. So mind is the third level, third covering. And mind itself needs intellect and ego to handle its workings. So, so intellect, ego, that forms another sheet. And beyond all that is a sheet of unconscious that keeps all in record. And the real you emerges when all these sheets move away from you. But even while you are with sheets, you are there. The sun is always there. No matter how much you may see the sun, 
confined to a jar. This, that confined to the jar is your interpretation. The sun has no problem. How you f view the soul within you is through your mind. Enlighten the mind, that soul is always the tattva mati, thou art that. From the absolute point of view, the soul is essentially Brahman. Without mind, without pranas, without body, without intellect, without ego, without time, space, causation. The soul experiences the world process as a result of the force of ignorance operating through his limited mind. Just as waves arise in the ocean, so too do the experiences of the world. Even the very concepts of time and space <laughs> arise from the mind. At times, tiny ripples are whipped into mighty waves by the wind. Giving you a simile, just like you see little gentle bay wave, simmer of waves on the ocean. But suddenly they become big waves. Same way sometimes your mind is very gentle, enjoying relaxation. But soon you say wave goodbye to relaxation. <laughs> Go after waves. <laughs> the tiny vrittis of the mind can be whipped into gigantic waves. In the ocean of Brahman, the souls are like tiny whirlpools. These in turn give rise to Bubbles of numerous worlds. It is Brahman who assumes the role of a jiva. Bubbles of world, how could you understand? Think of your dream, how many bubbles come in one, one night? <laughs> it is only a little bubble, even bubble has some substance. But this has no substance. So speaking in profound terms, the world, all the world that is experienced through the mind and senses, the world that is transient, conditioned by time and space, that world is not the giver of your happiness. That world is not your real residence. That world is a vast mirage. And that point has to enter the heart. And this is the message of all religions of the world. But that doesn't mean that you suddenly become disgusted with the world. Because <laughs> you become disgusted, then all the disgust brings more mud in your head. In other words, it's not real understanding has a, it's like a blossoming of a flower. You cannot force a tree to blossom. Though blossoming is the teaching. Don't stay just a stick, blossom. <laughs> <laughs> but allow the nature to work through it.
it is a self that creates the experience of waking state, dream state, deep sleep state, and freed of illusion, the self shines as a, uh, like the sun, absolute light of lights. All this arises in Brahman. All this is sustained by Brahman. And all this is dissolved in Brahman. Whenever you have difficulty, just think of your dream. All the dream arises of your consciousness. All your dream is sustained by your consciousness, not by your pillows. And all the dream dissolves in your consciousness. In the same way, all the experience of the universe, no matter how vast, every field of learning is so vast that it will take you thousand births you want to explore it. <laughs> and yet all this is nothing but Pure consciousness, Brahman, the I am. I am that am I. In fact, the world does not exist. Therefore, there is no relationship between the Brahman and the world. Just as garland of pearl may seem to appear in the sky before the eyes of a person who has defective vision, so to the world process is experienced due to the ignorance that veils the vision of the self. So with this we will conclude. Om Triambakam Jamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urvarukma Bandhanan Mrityor Mukshyama Amritat Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyant Makashidukabhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Om Hari Om Shri Ramayana If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring you the mic. Hello. Hello. If, if one were to be enlightened in this lifetime, would that change the uh, life circumstances also? Mm, if one is enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> One would achieve that uh, permanent state of joy and contentment and peace to a higher degree. First, if you are enlightened, you have to follow that point. You are enlightened. It's just like you are asking the sun. You are no longer in the bucket. You are the sun. Now, what do you want with the bucket? In other words, enlightened state does not deal, if you wake up from your dream, you don't deal with dream problems or dream situations. Since I have awakened, should my dream be remembered by me in a positive way? <laughs> well, that's, I'm just making a joke. <laughs> Sometimes when you're like for long periods of time, you go in, those st in that stage where there's joy and happiness and it's continuous <coughs> and you don't worry about anything. And how, 
other people relate to you in a strange way. You don't care anymore? <laughs> Ask Jesus. <laughs> he went through all cross. <laughs> and he was one with God. And then another question is, um, in the afterlife, like what you explain, and it's fascinating, right? And I, all my life I was drawn to the Vedas. So it's just to, it seems totally realistic to me. But what about all these people who are so uh, strong in their belief what happens after death, like Christians or Islamists or China, whatever? Uh, do <coughs> they experience the afterlife in terms of their belief? Or no, belief is doesn't regulate the science. Doesn't <laughs> so it's the belief. It's the same for everybody. Same for everybody. Remember that um, this coming Sunday, very close, we'll be celebrating Krishna Janmashtami. So we'll be gathering here at, uh, to begin at 5 p.m. instead of 5.30. So join us on Sunday. And uh, we welcome Rebecca a second time. Uh, I guess you realize Tuesday and Wednesday night we have your Vishishta. And on Friday night, some of you lectures on the Tulsi Ramayana, same time, 7.30. On Monday and Thursday, although Swamiji is not with us in the satsang room, um, on Thursday night, there's a discussion group that meets at 6. It's open to all, and it's a circular arrangement of those who come, and they're discussing various philosophical to topics and sharing their opinions. So that's from 6 to about 7. And Saturday night, uh, pranayama at 7, guided meditation with Swamiji at 7.30. So now, come joyously. <laughs>